students that Concordia cares about your professional life after you graduate, but also to offer some of the actual skills you're looking for in the transition to the workplace. I'm here today with my colleague Yannick Dehan, who you might recognize by now if you've been to some of our programming. She's the person who's tasked with developing our career services programs, events, and everything we're doing in this realm, really, for alumni in Montreal and around the globe. So I would like to just ask that you would please recognize the work that she's been doing so far. I would also like to thank the, pre uh, the presenter tonight, Julian. Thank you so much for your insight and for being available to share your experience with us. And since I'm sure you guys are ready to learn, and just as you know, a little you know, note to the people who come late to try to come earlier next time, we're going to hand it right over to you, and I'm sure you're ready to get started. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Temi, and thank you both, Yannick. I'd like to welcome all of you here. So thank you very much for joining our first Digital for Jobs series. Um, I'm myself, Jim Julian Gaydon Montella. I'm going to be co-instructing this session with Kieran Desmond, who's also joining us from Ireland. He's the other gentleman that you see here in the picture. You won't be able to see him, but at least you'll be able to hear him. So he hears everything, by the way. Be careful what you say. Um, Kieran, maybe you just want to say a quick hello as well, so we know that you're here in the room. Hi. Good, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to join you all. Oh, perfect. Well, it's nice to hear you, Kieran. So, what I will say basically about this course to start things off is that uh, digital is a subject that myself and Kieran, we are incredibly passionate about. It's something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis as we're helping people and companies uh, use digital media to brand themselves and to make money for their business. So it's something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and we have a lot of experience behind it. But you are going to be the stars of this presentation because in the next hour and, I believe, 20 minutes now that I have left, what we're going to do is we're going to teach you, and throughout these subsequent modules, we want to share with you how you can use digital media to find a job, first thing, and two, if you already have a job and you're looking to go to the next level in your career, how you can go about doing that as well. Now, I think this is a particularly relevant subject, especially as we speak, because one thing that you might be aware of is the fact that the entire process of job filling and of recruiting is in fact becoming digitized. It's not a surprise because it makes perfect sense for a recruiter to use a platform like LinkedIn, which we're going to be spending a lot of time on, but it makes it a lot easier for them because they only have to enter a few keywords, find a list of candidates, and they already have access to your profile. So the more you know about this subject, the better it is going to be. But we want to take this a step further. And there's going to be basically two focuses from the six sessions that we're going to be offering for you, which is the first part is going to be to look at your profile. And the first two modules are going to be really focused on your profile because it starts with you. Before you can be an effective networker, before you are effective at selling anything, you need to sell yourself first. Hello, welcome. <laughs> now, the idea is that we are going to be building onto each module. And I myself, of course, I wish for all of you to attend and you know to be there for every single module. But the idea is that none of the modules are going to be the same. They're all going to be going further and exploring deeper into the subject. So I would like to recommend and to encourage all of you to join in the modules as we're going to be developing them. And you'll understand that there's a big art behind this because it's not just about having a fantastic profile. In fact, one thing I can tell you from all my subsequent jobs having been a manager at uh, Google, having been a manager at Marin Software and many other different things, is you have to know how to network. You have to understand how to build relationships with people by using social media. And yes, it is possible because it's an argument that I have many times when I'm in tech industry or in any other networking scenarios that I've seen here in Montreal, and people tell me that they don't believe in the power of social media. But I can tell you it's not an innocent or unhuman experience. We are all human beings at the end of the day. We are all human beings operating and using and interacting across these media. And we have to understand how to use these effectively. So I know that sounds like a lot, but that's the goal of these subsequent sessions. So without further ado, I guess I'm just going to make two small announcements. Uh, the first is that given time, I suppose, what we will do is probably hold off on questions until the end. We have a questions period planned at the end. And I'll be kind enough to um, uh, take questions from you, the crowd that is here live. All the crowd that is attending as well online will be taking questions from you. 
Kieran is going to be monitoring. For those of you who are joining us via webinar, uh, Kieran is also going to be looking at the chat function, so feel free to write in there. Now, all that said, I will also be around after the session if you'd like to speak with me. I know that we'll be sharing our details, so feel free to write to me directly afterwards as well. And if that was not enough, I believe Concordia is going to put you in touch with us as well. So there'll be plenty of ways for you to come and reach us or ask us any questions that you might have. Now, now that I've said that, I suppose I also want to give my thanks to the Concordia team. They're sitting conspicuously next to each other right now. Um, that's the two ladies that you see there at the back. It's, uh, I'd like to thank Yannick Dahan and Temi Akinaina for their help in setting this up. Uh, we're delighted to be here, and thank you very much for having us. All right. I'm also going to be doing a bit of exercise because I didn't bring a clicker. So um, one thing I do want to say is that we have an incentive. For those of you who are going to be attending all six modules, we are going to give out a certificate in digital networking and branding. So that's something else to add to your CV. Most importantly, your LinkedIn CV because that's you know an extra thing that will attract attention. So I try to encourage you as much as possible to come into all the lessons. We are going to be giving you plenty of information of when the next ones are, what they're going to include, and not only that, all these sessions are also recorded. So you'll be able to have this information afterwards as well, if you can bear with my voice. All right, so the goal for today, in fact, just a second. There we go. Now, the goals for today is basically very simple. We are going to focus, though, on your profile. The big overarching goals is to help you find jobs and to create job opportunities by using social media, how to do that. And the other part of it is how to brand yourself effectively, how to convey to others your value and who you are and why that would align with the job that you are trying to get. So I'll start with you. And that's the reason why we've started Lesson 1 with your profile. Because before you can sell anything at all, you need to sell yourself. And I can tell you I've seen thousands and thousands of LinkedIn profiles. Um, some very good, some very bad, and I'm not going to name anything or anyone. But one of the things that we have come across is that we start to notice patterns after starting to see so many, and we also tested them. So all the things that we are giving you now, as far as Kieran and myself is concerned, is experience of things that we know actually work. We've put them to practice ourselves. Uh, in fact, 70% of our business comes by using LinkedIn at the moment. So, you know, it is a platform that we are very familiar with. Okay, so this is a bit of a menu for what we are covering today. We're going to be looking at three different things. And by the way, the next two sessions, as I mentioned, are going to be on your profile. And the goal here is to create a profile that is going to be a profile that's going to attract attention, first of all. The second part is we also need to understand how to create a profile where you are very clearly communicating to others what your value is and that that value is going to align with something that they're interested in. Remember that you're doing this to basically appeal to them in a way. You're, making, you're doing this with a particular goal in mind. Okay, so I mentioned the word goals and that's very important. In fact, that's one thing that I want to be um, I believe it's probably the most important thing to start with because you're going to hear this time and time again from Kieran and myself, which is goal setting is the very first thing that we start with when we do anything. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to social media. Whether you're going to be using jobs.ca or whether you're going to be using Monster or whether you're going to be using anything else to find a job, you need to have a very clear goal and a very clear objective. And the reasons for that are simple. Clear goals lead to clear actions which lead to clear results. And you know, the converse of that is the same as well. If you're unclear about what you're looking for, you're going to have unclear actions and you're probably going to get very random results. Now, I understand that for some of you, you have a lot of experience. It could be very varied experience. You might have two things that you do very well or maybe more, and you might be looking for jobs of all sorts. So we are going to cover that in subsequent lectures and I want you just to keep that in mind. But the idea is that you still need to go in with a goal. And I'm doing this from a personal reason as well, which is my own personal experience from being on LinkedIn and Twitter, which I absolutely love as far as platforms, but it's easy to get lost. 
you know, there's so many great articles out there. There's so many great things that are being published. I can easily get lost like Alice in Wonderland looking at all the wonderful things that are being published out there. Now, I don't do it because I'm clear as to why I am on these social media and I'm aware of why I'm there. So all my actions make sense and they're all going towards my goals. So please have goals. That's basically the point of this, of this slide over here. Um, I think it's important that before we dive into looking at your platforms, I just wanted to give you a quick tour of the different platforms that we're going to cover in this course overall and why they are important to job search. So LinkedIn makes sense to be here because it is the number one uh, professionals network. It's where 90% of recruiters will be going to look for their candidates. So by and large, LinkedIn is the place to be if you're looking for work both as a job seeker or as somebody who's looking to fill a role. I just want you to be aware that LinkedIn does much more than just that. LinkedIn, in fact, has evolved quite a lot. It's become a big monster. In fact, as it is, it is the number one platform where businesses come to connect. It's a platform that is used for sales. It's a platform that is used to reach people because you, know, you can target, and you can target by job title. You can target by a lot of different things. Now, of course, this works for recruiters as well. Makes sense to be on LinkedIn. A few words then on the other platforms because we brought in Twitter and we brought in Facebook and there's reasons why I brought them up there. Twitter, I know that Kieran is an absolute guru and fan. Um, he can certainly give you a lot more advice as far as Twitter goes. I use it very often as well. But we know that we've seen, in fact, I myself have gotten two job offers uh, via Twitter. And the reason why Twitter works is keep in mind why it's there. Twitter is a fantastic platform for trending. It's very short, very succinct. People talk about it. They create a big fuss about things that are on Twitter. And companies love it because it is the place where they can share news about what they're doing and all the initiatives that they are taking part in. So if you want to find out the latest about what a company is doing, Twitter is probably one of the best places to do it because they update it the most frequently, more frequently than any other platform that they would be looking at. And interestingly, this also comes from my own personal experience, we found that certainly at the higher echelons, people that are difficult to reach tend to respond a lot more on Twitter. And there's certain reasons behind this. I guess there's a lot of etiquette, but LinkedIn has also become a lot better now at um, you know, safeguarding. People won't necessarily respond to your messages or they won't respond right away. But Twitter seems to have a much better and a quicker response rate. So there's a lot of good reasons why you might want to use Twitter as a way to sort of distinguish yourself. And keep in mind that Twitter now allows for biographies to be on there, which we're going to cover. So, you know, people can have access to your information on Twitter. It's one that I really like to consider. Facebook, um, you know, Facebook still, I guess, in the general public, tends to be seen as a social media. It's very casual. It's the place that you go if you want to share pictures of your friends, of your family. You know, it's where you put up all your pictures of your latest ski trip. Now, Facebook as a business has actually evolved as well. They are trying to get into the business space with mixed results. Um, the only thing I can say is that they have upgraded to the point where they include now your work experience and they also include your um, education. Now, personally, the statistics Statistics will say that Facebook is not as commonly used by recruiters. And what I can tell you is that you know Facebook is really much more used as a vetting tool. So it's the type of place where a recruiter will be going, maybe not to check out what your work experience is, but they might have a look at your Facebook to make sure that you know, you're not hunting elephants in your free time, or you know, that you are uh, not a sociopath, so that you're just simply someone you know, that is acceptable and is not going to put the company in an awkward spot. So just keep in mind that people will check your Facebook. And by the way, it also appears in Google search results when people type your name. So this is one of these things about your personal image that you might want to keep in mind. But we are going to cover Facebook uh, at some extent as well. Okay. Well, ladies and gents, we're going to be talking about you. And we're going to start by looking at your profile. Now, I'm going to start with pictures and visuals because, as it turns out, Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. As it turns out, uh, pictures and visuals 
are the number one thing that psychologically we are wired to react to. And I do think that when you are going to be using pictures, they should all tell a story about you. And they should tell the story that you want people to know. In fact, LinkedIn, as you'll see, has actually changed the dynamics of CVs. They've made it much more image rich. They're making it much more engaging than the typical old CV that used to be just written on black and white paper. There's many reasons why pictures are important. I suppose what I care about is that you're using the right type of pictures and the pictures are telling the story that you care for people to hear. So this is what we're going to be discussing. So I'm going to start with a little exercise where I'm going to pick your brains. What I've done here is I've put together a list of the absolute best profile pictures from some of my contacts. And by the way, I know. Yes, sorry, Tammy, go ahead. Oh, I think we can. Let's see, we should be able to. Is that better? And if we put it maybe somewhere down here? Is that good for everyone? Yeah? Okay. Well, democracy is an important thing, so we just have to be sure. All right. Um, one thing I wanted to start with is looking at profile pictures. And what I've put together is the compilation of the most fantastic ladies and gentlemen from my contacts list, and that I know that they have fantastic photos. Now, I want to ask you, and we are going to share with you with this later, but I want to see why do you think these are great pictures? And we do have a microphone, so I can allow for some of you here to respond if you'd like. Does anybody want to take a guess as to why these are fantastic pictures? Okay, so we have the faces clear. That's good. Yes? Anyone? Oh, I really like that. That's very good. And a very um, you know, thorough description. Very good. Appreciate that. Yes? Yes. Very important. That's very good. That's happy. OK. Well, there's a certain science about that. And in fact, we are going to cover it. But you did mention something very important, which is the smile. So I'll talk about that in a second. Yes? It's as if they were looking at you. Yeah, very good, very good. OK, well, we still have one more, yes? Mm -hmm. OK. You know, I have this uh, distinct impression that you guys maybe have seen my slides before, because you've actually hit all of them uh, correctly. So let me just see here. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to go through each one of them, though, just maybe to explain them a little bit better and more in depth. So smile. In fact, it's the number one thing that I found was the common element here. And there's a reason for it. The human psychology aspect of things will tell us that just like in a networking situation, right? because this is what it is, don't kid yourself, whether you are doing this via digital media or you are in real life, a smile is something that we are wired to recognize. It is perhaps one of the easiest, most recognizable human emotions. And it does something else. A smile is a symbol of confidence. And as Our Lady in the back very correctly said, approachability. So smiling is very key. Now, I want to just go back for a second because you are going to notice that they were all smiling in one way or another. So smile is very important. Now, we also had someone that was mentioning looking at the camera. That's also very key. And the reason for that is because it's just as if we were in a real life situation. We are programmed to react to a face when it looks at us. That's the way that we humans interact. And especially one that is smiling is even more inviting. So they're looking at the camera. Now, I want to say this because I've seen a lot of profile pictures. And I know that there are some fantastic photographers out there. I know that they do a lot of great artwork. Now, remember, though, that having a fantastic picture is one thing. Having a fantastic picture for LinkedIn is a whole different ballgame. And remember that you're on LinkedIn, hopefully to get a job or hopefully to brand yourself. Now, having a very good picture 
needs to make sure that you are looking straight onwards and focusing on the center of attention, which will be somebody that's looking at your photo. I.e., you can have a great, fantastic, artistic picture of you looking in another direction, but I'd prefer if you don't use it as your LinkedIn profile picture. That's my main message. Not busy doing something else. You'll see that very frequently. I've seen people that are too busy for their own photo shoot where, you know, they're sort of there the, with a phone on, the, on their ear and they're pretending, you know, like they're talking to someone else. I'm not sure what message you're trying to convey, but remember that the messaging here is important. Somebody who's looking at you and is smiling is signaling that I'm someone interesting, I'm someone confident, and you should speak to me. And I believe that that's the message that we should be giving in our LinkedIn pictures. We did talk about clear and light background. I know that was another part that was brought up. Um, very important. You, believe it or not, are the most important thing in that LinkedIn picture. So it is you that should be the main subject of attention. So don't, you know, contrast that with backgrounds that are going to take away from you as being the main focus. And well-dressed, well, I have a bit of a story on this one because I have spoken with a lot of my colleagues who used to work at LinkedIn. And one of the things they used to say was, as a guidance, if you want to know what the best LinkedIn picture is, they said, imagine that you already got the job that you were looking for and that that company was going to offer you to become their poster boy or their poster girl and they were going to feature you on their website and on any of their posters. Now I want you to picture what that picture would look like because that is the picture that you want on your LinkedIn profile. You'd be well dressed, you'd be smiling, you'd be presentable. That's the photo that you want for your LinkedIn profile. And it's hugely important because before anyone even has a chance to even read your profile, before they even had a chance to see your name, before they even had a chance to look at your tagline, which are all the things that we're going to cover later, within the first 10 milliseconds of looking at anything, the first thing they will look at is your picture. And that's what there's going to be in their judgment process. They're going to be trying to see, are you someone interesting that I want to pay more attention to? So it's important to have a good picture. Okay, so we talked about profile pictures. I think it makes sense that we also cover background photos because all of the platforms that we are discussing, in fact, allow you to have background photos. Now, there's no need for you to go absolutely crazy in trying to find background pictures. I have some tips, though, because they do make sense. And what we normally suggest is that you use background photos in a way that is going to help you for your mission, that has something to do with your goal. And, you know, they're not innocent photos. They could complement you and help you in what you're trying to do. It's a double-click system. I don't know why I have to click twice every time. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about background pictures, and I'll tell you a story about this one as well. So the number one thing is that they should be light. They should not be too distracting, unlike what you see up here. But I'll explain this one in a second. Yes, come on in. That's fine. That's fine. Welcome. So your background pictures should be light, and the reason for this is because you're trying not to distract from your photo. Your picture, your profile picture, is the number one thing that should be visible in there. So once again, this is not the greatest example, but I will explain why this is still a good combination that he's put together. Now, my main message here for background pictures is try and use a background picture that is complementary to what you're trying to do. If, for example, you're trying to get a job in engineering, wouldn't it make sense, and you're trying to build a profile as an engineer, doesn't it make sense to have a background that has something to do with engineering? If you are trying to build a background in journalism, if you're trying to build a background in anything at all, you know, these pictures are designed, you know, not just there for decoration. You can use them to something that's going to help you. And my suggestion is to use it, you know, by putting something that's related to your theme. And I just wanted to show you mine because I don't just give advice. You know, we, we practice what we say. Um, mine, in fact, I'm in the digital space. So mine has something to do with digital. You know, and that's the idea. We're always trying to, I guess the word here is create cohesion, which is that everything in that profile is leading to a certain message. And it's delivering that same message in unison. So that's my suggestion for the background pictures. Now, if you can't find something that's related to what you're trying to do, I then just suggest that you use something that's light and doesn't distract. You can use dead art. 
You can use cityscape outlines if you like. The idea is, though, just to make sure your picture is the number one thing that stands out. This gentleman here, the one that we're looking at, Will Kintish, he's a networking guru. And Kieran and myself, we're lucky to have him as one of our mentors. Now, the only reason why I accept what he's put up there, because in fact we've told him what we thought about his background pictures, right? Now, the only reason why we accept what he's put up there is because what he's trying to do is to put you in the scenario of what you would have to live if you were going to ask for his services. So he's trying to put you straight on into this complicated event that you see with all sorts of people around and he wants you to understand that he's the person that would help you to navigate this confidently. So he's a networking expert, he wants to put you already into the scenery. Now, I've put it up there as an exception. I think my own advice would simply be to try and use something that's you know, more relevant to your field and something that's not as distracting. Okay, pictures. LinkedIn allows you to put pictures and it's not something innocent. You know, by the way, pictures in LinkedIn are not just appealing to the human eyes. Remember that there's always two sets of eyes that are looking at your profile. You'll have all the people like recruiters or anyone who's checking your background, you know, who are looking at your profile. And you'll also have the technology that is scanning through your profile to try and give you a rank and a score. And this is something that's important because I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but you know that you all have a score on LinkedIn. I see a lot of blank faces, so that's good because this is the place to learn about it. So in fact, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is and you know what actually contributes to your LinkedIn score. So it's called the SSI. It's not hugely important that you know uh, what the acronym stands for. It means Social Selling Index. It's a very nice way for LinkedIn to say how popular you are based on how elaborate and how many people have seen your profile. Now, we know a few things about the SSI, and the only thing that is important to you are the factors that either raise it or lower it. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, one thing that does help your SSI is pictures. And it doesn't have to be pictures of you at work. It can be. In fact, I've given you some examples. But it can be all sorts of other things, everything that you see up here. Websites. If you have a website, and if you believe that it's useful and if it contributes to what you're trying to do as far as your job search, feel free to put those up there. Links and videos. All of these things tell a story about who you are, what your skills are. And by the way, it's not just about seeing your skills on white, on black and white. It's also about giving the person the opportunity to relive and actually be able to see for themselves that you have those skills. Awards and certifications is another great one. I know of a lot of you that probably have been awarded something at some stage or you have a certification of some sort and yet how many LinkedIn profiles you know would have this at the very bottom somewhere buried away and they don't show them if you've been awarded and if you've been recognized for something please put them on there now there's another reason why I say this to you because coming from someone who's actually done a lot of interviews as myself being the interviewer what I can tell you is that we always do look at people's profiles and these things stand out. And this is giving you the chance, instead of having awkward conversations or having to start from scratch, you're giving someone the chance to already find out something interesting about you and why you stand out. And I guarantee you, things like this will come up in the conversation. You know, an interviewer will say, wow, I saw that you were recognized for such and such, or that you have a certification in such and such. Or if you have pictures, or you have designed a website, you know, all these things contribute to creating a human bond with someone. So it's important to have them. And it's not just to ensure that they have a rich visual experience. Now, for the photos, I guess there was one small thing I wanted to mention, which is if you are going to put pictures, make sure that those pictures say something about you. You know, they shouldn't be innocent photos. For example, you know, if you look at the one on the right, um, there's a picture of me when I graduated from the Google managerial program. And the story goes that we were 45 people that started together and only five of us went on to complete the two years manager program. Now, I'm not saying this to brag about it. It's something that I've lived as an experience. I'm doing it though because I'm allowing someone now not just to see it in writing, but they can see the actual moment. They can relive that. And that's something that will stand out to them when they're looking at my CV. 
Now, if you did work, for example, if you have any artwork or anything, you know, if you're, for example, an engineer, an architect, you know, it doesn't have to be a picture about you. It could be a picture about what you do, which is equally just as good. Remember the big message here is to make sure that it contributes to what your goal is. You're trying to advance yourself towards what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Taglines. This is wholly different because we were talking about visuals and what visuals communicate. And visuals, by the way, are very important because they're the first thing that people notice, right? And they do add an extra dimension to your CV. But we can't get away from what you have to write. So the way it works is that within the first 10 to 20 milliseconds of someone looking at your photo and finding you interesting, because once you've taken all these things on board, I'm sure they will. Now, the next thing they're going to look at is your tagline. LinkedIn has very cruelly, or uncruelly, as however you like to see it, decided to summarize each one of us in one sentence. And that sentence is key, because that sentence is trying to respond to this question, which is the normal question that we all ask ourselves. In any human context, especially when we don't know someone, what we're always trying to find out is, who are you, and why should I care? So what we're trying to do with the tagline is push that who are you and why should I care and convert that into oh wow you are interesting please tell me more because that's what's going to make sure they're going to go and look at your profile and of course from there that's where you have a chance to sell you know what your value is and why you would be a good fit for them so I have shared with you the two uh, versions of the most successful taglines what we've done is we've actually looked and we've tested ourselves to see there's very there's many different types of taglines. But what we've done is we've put together a list of the ones that we know that time and time again get good reaction. And there's reasons why they both work. So I'm going to give you a tour of both of them and explain why they are so effective. So the first one is what we call a divider tagline. It's basically a set of your different roles broken down by a divider line. Now, does anybody want to guess why this works very well? Yes, well, it does create a bit more clarity, at least uh, as far as that goes. Special request here for people who are on the webinar. We can't actually hear any of the answers coming back, so if we were able to give the second mic to people who are actually answering. Yeah, that seems like a fair request, or I could also just repeat what the gentleman has said. But you know what? For the yeah. sake of experiment, well, because we do have two microphones, so let's use the resources. If you don't mind just saying again what you said. Yes. Um, at least to me it looks like it's... Uh, you can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, to me it looks like uh, it separates better when using the vertical divider <coughs> than for instance, other types of... And, uh, ah, sound has gone very low. Okay, I'll just try and repeat what, what he said. Okay. Um, I guess, by the way, sorry, what was your name? Adrian. So what Adrian has said is that it creates a certain clarity because, you know, the dividers are sort of there to categorize the different roles, and it's easy to spot them. Okay, well, that's one answer. Anybody else would like to try? Yes? I will try. I think you were first. Okay, fantastic. So it summarizes your top skills and top experience. Um, I think for the sake of time, I will go on, but I will allow more questions as we go along. So the reason why it works, in fact, is all related to human relations, once again. Now, yes, it does create a lot more clarity, and it is visually a lot easier. It's a lot more summarized. But there's another very important key aspect here, which is that it's showing you, first of all, to be a very well-rounded person, because it shows that you do much more than just one job. Two is that you're also creating what we call multiple connector points. So for example, if I read you mine, you have co-founder and director of digital skills, entrepreneur, digital trainer, you know, junior chamber international president. There's a lot of different things that I've done. Now, somebody might not really care about the fact that I'm an entrepreneur, or that's not what they are interested in. However, what I'm doing is I'm giving everyone a chance to find something interesting from what I'm doing. So they might be interested in me, for example, as a digital trainer. Or they might see me as the corporate coach. 
and they're saying, you know what, we have everything down as far as digital, but we like somebody who can give us more advice as to how to grow our business. So what you're doing is essentially you're putting on display all your skills and you're giving people a chance at different levels to connect with you for different reasons. So this is the reason why it works so well. Now, a few words about this one. Um, a little bit of advice. Remember that we're talking about your roles and not your actual job title per se. I've left my job titles in there because they are easily understood by the public at large. But if you have a job title that is slightly complicated or complex, I would try and simplify it and I would try and describe it the way that you would describe it to someone you know, at large in the public. Now, the reason for that is simple. is because you don't know who's going to read your profile. And there's a good chance that it may be somebody in your industry, at which point they won't mind reading something that's simplified. They'll understand the value that you have. But if it's not, and if it were a recruiter, for example, who has limited or no experience, or you know, is just limited on what they've been told, you still want to, for them to be able to understand that you are what they're looking for. So my advice is try and find ways to describe what you do rather than put a job title. There's another reason for it too. And now I'm going back on personal experience. So another important thing is remember that a company is not going to hire you for what you did at the previous company. They're not hiring you for that role that you had there. There's every good chance that when they will hire you, they're going to do it and they're going to give you a new title or they're going to give you a new job description. What they really want is what you have to offer what value you gave to the other previous company and what value you can transfer over that will you know, amount to something for them. So this is what you have to be able to key in on. Remember to make sure to describe it in a way that they can understand. Okay, I don't see any questions, so it looks like everyone understood. I'm going to read the second one, which is the storyline version. The storyline version works because we are programmed to respond to stories. It works because it's catchy. It works because it's something we remember. If you think back to certain songs or stories that you were told as kids, you remember them because you know that's the way the human brain actually works. And you know it's just a common thing that everyone tells you in networking as well. If you want people to remember you, tell them a story about yourself. Now, it works in this also, and I wanted to share with you one from one of my colleagues that we know is really, really good. So by the way, Laura Noletta Crocker, a bit of background for her. Uh, we started together as Google, and she's currently a manager and recruiter now at Groupon. Now, the last time I spoke to her, she had, on average, over 30 profile views per, per day on her LinkedIn. And one of the things that I did notice about her is that she has one of the best taglines that I've seen. So with her permission, she knows, by the way, that I'm speaking about her here today, uh, and she's okay with it. So I wanted to read you hers because I thought it was really well put together and it's one that I would like to share with you as a good sample. So I'll read it out. It says, discovering top talent for Groupon because great people make great companies. And you know, this is a fantastic example of communication done at its best. Now, she's done a lot of things in a very short amount of space. She's managed to tell you why she's passionate about what she does. You know she's good at it. She's told you why she does what she does. And as it turns out, she's done the one most important thing. She's already sold herself within this one sentence. If I was looking for a recruiter and I was reading this and I was saying, because great people make great companies, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who's determined. I'm looking for someone who's good at what they do. And I'm looking for someone who has a purpose behind it. So. Whichever tagline you would prefer to use, we'll leave that up to you. But my suggestion is, you know, these are time and time again the ones that have proven to work really, really well. So our recommendation is to use either of these two styles. So a quick recap. Remember that your tagline is there to convey your value, right? You have to explain why it is that you are valuable. And the other thing that I recommend is to make sure that you don't uh, put just a job title. It is not a job title. You are selling yourself, even if it's one tagline, even if it's one sentence, you are already trying to sell yourself in there. So you have to convey what it is that you do. And because we don't live in a world of theory, 
uh, we decided that we were going to give you a little exercise, in fact, to put it all into practice. So, um, for all those of you who are joining us live, what I will ask you to do is I would like for you to find a partner. If you can team up with someone, it can be the person next to you. We'll give you a little bit of time to do that, but we're going to get you to find a partner. Okay. For those of you who are at home and listening on the webinar, you'll get the wonderful honor and pleasure of putting together your own tagline. Now what we're going to do is, and I know by the way that it's not fair, but we're only going to give you five minutes to speak to each other and you don't get to write your own tagline, but you're going to have to write a tagline for the other person. Okay? So we're going to give you five minutes and you guys are going to have to put together a tagline for that person that's your partner. Okay? Yeah, for each other. So I'm going to read out some of the um, some of the great taglines that are coming in in here on live webinar, if people don't mind. Belinda, I just see your your great tagline example. Do you mind if I if I read it out? So Valinda has given an example of together we can conquer anything. I like it. It's great. So anybody else on the webinar, if you would like to um, to actually uh, to give your example for your tagline, uh, that'd be great. Excellent. So I see a few of them coming in there now. So one from Eve is uh, translating your ideas into excellence. That's great. I really like that. Uh, Tasha has given one and a creative mind driven to see a better tomorrow great I like that uh, Basem has given an example graduate with a Bachelor of Commerce okay I hmm I'd probably look for something that's a bit more progressive, that looks for kind of a vision of what you want to be or where you want to go. Um, so my, my tagline, for example, on Twitter is predicting the future by creating it. It's based off of a, a quote I like from Abraham Lincoln. Um, so I just see Laurel's example here. Um, finding home away from home for students coming to Concordia that's great like that really gives me an idea of, of what what you do and what your goal is uh, see Claire's example here so converting your data into business success great I mean that's very descriptive it's to the point next we have Chantal if you care about customer service excellence like I do then we are meant to meet that's great I like that because again it's simple 
I know that okay, you must be in the customer service business and you know customer service excellence. And um, straight away, if I was you know a potential customer, I'd be interested. So I see Catlin's one here. So helping others integrate fitness into their life because life is better lived healthy. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can get your attention for a second, we're going to give you 30 seconds and then unfortunately we're going to have to start, or fortunately we're going to have to start back again. So 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Great, I can read out maybe two more and then we're going to be starting back again. So we'll take Kathleen's one. Helping others integrate fitness into their lives life because into their life because life is better lived healthy. That's good. I would probably shorten it a little bit. Um, if you like I can I can give you some feedback in a moment to, to help. Um, so I'm looking at Howes one, co founder of Seven Stars College uh, slash entrepreneur. Yeah, that's fine. You're using the technique where you kinda of separate out the different things you do. And I'll take one more. Ah, Basim, I see that you've come back with a second example. Crunching numbers for a living. That's a bit better. See, for me, that's much better than... Um, it kind of paints a picture. I think that's a much better uh, exa example. I just see your question as well, Madeline. Uh, is it appropriate to use a quote as your tagline? So if you do need to cite the quotes... If you can, try and take a quote and make it into something that's your own. Kind of like my example of uh, predicting the future, the future by creating it. So, ladies and gents, I will kindly ask you to please drop everything that you're doing. Okay, and I do understand that it's not the easiest thing to do, to put together a good tagline in five minutes. So I apologize, but I don't apologize because I think that it's good in the sense that it's gotten your wheels turning. Now, the point of this exercise was sort of multifold because one thing you will understand is that it's also a good exercise in understanding how effectively you communicate to someone else and to see what they return to you. And likewise, it's also good because I'm hoping you maybe have gotten some ideas from the person next to you as to things that you could include in your tagline. So in the interest of time, which I know that uh, people are following very carefully, we are on time. I will maybe just ask one or two people here, and we can maybe hear some from the webinar as well. Does anyone want to share a tagline that they are happy with, something that they think is absolutely outstanding? Uh, maybe I'll say that again. Does anyone want to share a tagline? <laughs> OK. Uh, we have a microphone somewhere around. Oh, yeah, perfect. It was in the same alley. It was just prepared for you there. I wrote this Go ahead. one for Alana. It's okay. A, my name's Mike. I bring people together in my professional and community work because I want to support people in engaging with and learning from each other. Wow, I like it. Just one small little word of caution. Does that fit in 140 characters? Uh, the sound was a bit low there. Uh, would you be able to repeat it, Julian? Sure. Yeah, no, that's I fine. I bring people together in my professional and community work because I want to support people in engaging with and learning from each other. Uh, we'll read that again just to be sure. One last time. Third time is always the charm. Yeah, I tapered out a little bit. Can you hear us now? I can hear you, Julian, but the second mic's a little bit low. Okay, that's good. Um, I bring people together in my professional and community work because I want to support people in engaging with and learning from each other. That's great. So, a very nice description, very thorough, and I appreciate that, Mike, by the way. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, well, that's a good example. Does anyone have another one they would like to share? And we'll have to give you my microphone, I guess. So there's uh, 90 characters, so you don't have to be too concerned. Um, using, my love of, using my love of people and passion for HR to match ideal candidates to jobs they will both love and be passionate about. Great. Wow. Um, 
there was certainly some inspiration in there. I think we really got to hear the why you do what you do. And I think that's a very key thing. With it. So I don't know uh, if he wrote that for you, but you know, I would take that one as a nice one that you can use for yourself as well. It's a very good tagline. OK. All right, so that was the tagline. Now I think we have to go on, and we're going to have to move on to something else, which is we're going to look at your LinkedIn summaries, and we're going to look also at your biographies. Now, it's great to have a good tagline. Remember that your picture and your tagline are the first thing that anyone is going to see, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to be looking at your profile. Now, I want you to think of your biography and your profile summary as a movie trailer. And it works this way because, believe it or not, first of all, LinkedIn makes it optional for you to have one. So I'm going to be very explicit. You need a summary. It's that simple. And it's not just me trying to convince you. There's another reason why that's the case. It's because if you put yourself in the shoes of recruiters or anyone who is actually going to be looking at your LinkedIn profile, what I'm going to say is going to shock some of you, but it's the actual truth. You only have a window of anywhere between two to four seconds to impress someone who's looking at your profile and ensure that they're going to keep on reading or else they're going to skip on. Two to four seconds. You can count that in your head. It's very short. They are just glancing. They're not really looking at your profile. Now, what you have to do is you have to give them a reason to look at your profile. And that's what you do with your tagline, and it's also what you do with your summary. So you need a summary. And I can tell you that, unfortunately, even if you have a lot of experience, no one is actually going to go through the entire thing, once again, unless they have a reason. So by the way, I do empathize because I know that you're all wonderful people. As far as I know, yes. Now, you're all wonderful people, and it's hard to condense you into two to four paragraphs. But this is something that is going to come time and time again throughout your lives. You're going to be asked also this very repetitive question, so tell me about yourself. Right? It's going to be in a job interview. It can be in a meeting. It can be in networking situations. So why not be prepared? Why not have this all ready? In fact, if you have a very good summary, I guarantee you that instead of having that question, people are going to start picking at things from your summary, and you're going to be taking that conversation to a whole new level. You are conscientiously guiding what you want them to talk about already. And that's the objective of this. So let's look at your summary. I'll go through all of these points. So it's called a summary because, yes, it needs to be short. LinkedIn has kindly decided to limit now how much space you have for your summary. It used to be that you had absolutely no limits. Um, in fact, as of December last year, they have limited now to, I believe, 350 characters. In other words, think three paragraphs long. That's about how long you have for your summary. It needs to read like a story. Now, I don't need for all of you to become the next William Shakespeare. It's not necessary. What is necessary, though, is that you make it something that is going to be interesting and that is going to get read. And don't worry, we're going to share mine as an example. You can look at what it looks like and what it, you know, what it will look, appear, not just in theory. But one thing I can tell you is people, when they're going to be reading your summary, think also that if you were in their shoes and you're seeing hundreds of CVs in a week, day in, day out, the one that is going to stand out is the one that is actually written very well, the one that you know has taken the time to put it together into something that's interesting. And you know, it also says something about your personality and your communication skills when you can put together a very good summary. Now, I'm not going to hide anything from you. It took me two days to put mine together. And it was a very hard exercise because it was an exercise in getting rid of a lot of things. It takes time, but it's worth it. Now, there's also a few things which are not a secret about what a summary should look like and the way that it is structured. You want to start with a hook. A hook is a sentence that is going to set the tone for the rest of your summary. It is the first thing that people are going to read, and that's what's making up their mind. If you think of it in the terms of a movie trailer, it's what makes up the idea of whether you want to keep on watching or whether you're just going to skip on to something else. Now, my hook is three words. I've summarized myself in three words. It's digital and global. That's the way I describe myself. But that's just one example. One thing I like to recommend to people is, if you want to have a proper sentence in there, is you should start by explaining why it is that you do what you do. 
or why it is that you're trying to do what you're trying to do. Because you know that's the perfect way to tell people about your motivations, about how enthusiastic you are about what you're doing, and also it's the perfect excuse to start leading into all your skills and your experience. It's the greatest way to start. The end of your summary is also incredibly critical. And believe it or not, and I know we were having this conversation earlier at the back, I was speaking to one of the ladies there, and you know, I've seen a lot of summaries. And I can tell you that people sometimes have amazing summaries and yet they don't know how to end. They finish it off in a way that doesn't really convey anything about themselves or leaves things ambiguous. Now, let me just put this very clear. Your end of your summary should end with a call to action. Once you have told people what it is that you do and you've sold them on your value and what you have to offer, you have to tell them what you want to see happen next. That's the way it works, not just in here, it works in marketing. You'll always notice that people have a call to action. They are conscientiously telling you what they want to see happen next. And it's the same for you. Now what does that look like? Well, in my case, I'm doing it for business. So what I say to people is, let's connect. And I give them all the details of how they can reach me. Now it's very short, it's very succinct. In your case, if you're looking for a job or if you know the case is that you're trying to look for some employment, you could say, I'm looking forward to work in a company that, describe what it is that you're looking at, the experience that you're looking to live, and say, I'm looking forward to speak with you. Now you are already telling that person what you want to happen. And believe it or not, it works. And I've seen it time and time again. That's the way you end a summary. You're telling people what you want them to do. Okay. Um, we'll look at the body. I think it's maybe better if we look at it in, in live. I'll include that. One small thing I want to mention here is that it's important if you do have awards or recognitions or anything that will make you stand out, feel free to include that in your summary. That's also a good place to put it. You know, remember that you are competing with a lot of people that have similar experience that are going to have skills that are similar to yours. Now what makes you different? There are things that make you different. I don't know what they are, you do, but there are. And you have to think about what those are and you have to include them on there. So this is what my summary looks like. And the reason I didn't talk about the body is because there's something that I wanted to show you rather than talk about in theory. So one thing you'll notice is I have my hook at the very start. And you can see also that I have my um, call to action at the bottom. Now, in the middle, I've done two things. I have my two paragraphs listing what I do in normal sentences. Also, because I know that people are lazy and I'm not making this as an accusation, but this is LinkedIn. We know that social media people don't have a lot of time, right? It's very short, it's very quick, it has to be done this second. So, what I've done is I've actually taken the time to bullet point everything. They have it in sentences, they have it in bullet points. You have in bullet points what my specialties are in digital. You have in bullet points what my specialties are in the corporate coaching field. Therefore, if somebody doesn't have a lot of time and they're just glancing, at least the bullets will get their attention and they can get a quick sense of what I'm all about. So it's a good way to summarize myself. Okay, and we are almost at the end of our presentation and we are going to give some chance for you guys also to ask questions because I imagine there will be. But before we leave you, uh, we just wanted to cover Twitter and Facebook. So a word about Twitter is that Twitter also allows you to put together a biography. It's not as generous as LinkedIn. Um, you only have 160 characters that you can enter on Twitter. And before I show you what it looks like, I suppose we'll have to just cover what the items are. Um, now, the mission, though, is the same as what you would have on LinkedIn. The mission is to convey your value. The mission is to convey what it is that you do, why you do it, and yes, I understand it's a struggle to do it in 160 characters, but it is possible, and you're going to see from the examples how to do it. So, one other thing you really need to include in your Twitter bios is you need to include and make use of all the technological features. Make sure to use the at signs because that means if you're part of an organization, if you are already working for a company, you are showing that you're affiliated to them. It's potentially raising your audience. So it's good to have those in there. Use of hashtags is the same idea. You should use hashtags that are relevant to your industry. And by the way, it's not a secret which hashtags you should use. 
One thing I can recommend is Twitter actually tells you, you can search for keywords and you can see what are the most popular hashtags with regards to your search. Now those hashtags that are very popular and that might connect you to people who are in that industry, those are the ones that you want to put on your Twitter bio. Anytime that you're going to be posting on Twitter, there's more likelihood that you will be able to connect with these people or they'll be able to see what it is that you do. So use those to your advantage. Now, another thing that I'm mentioning here, but this applies to pretty much every social media. It could be LinkedIn, it could be Facebook, it could be Twitter. One thing you'll notice that Kieran and myself do time and time again is we cross-pollinate. What I mean by that is when I'm on LinkedIn, I give people my Twitter information. If they want to reach me on Twitter, they can do it. When I'm on Twitter, I give people my LinkedIn information. So we can sort of cross-reference each other. And what we're doing, essentially, is we're building up both of our audiences at the same time. And you can do this for Facebook as well, because you have space for this also. And I'll show you in a second. I just wanted to go back, though, because I wanted to read for you what the actual Twitter bios look like. So, by the way, I apologize, because I know the writing is very small. You can blame Twitter for that. Um, so I'll read mine, I'll read Kieran, because we wanted to give you the luxury of choice. You'll see that we are very similar. We teach a lot of the same things, but we've both come up with different versions. So I think for you, it's the benefit of choice. So in my case, I have digital trainer and corporate coach, passionate about digital and empowering startups. Co-founder at Digital Scales, I love inspiring people and ideas to succeed. And what you see there is my LinkedIn at the bottom. Now, the one thing I want to just go over again is the fact that I've used hashtags for all the specific industry words that I know are important. And I've also at our company. So if somebody wants to follow what Digital Skills Foundation is doing, they can do it. They can see about our company. They can find out more about us. I'll read you Kieran's. Or Kieran, do you want to read your own? Oh, yeah, Perfect. sure. One second. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, this is an older version we'll, we'll of my, uh, what's that? We'll call it long distance delay. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, no, I was, I was typing to, uh, to a few for the audience there. This, that's actually an older version of my Twitter profile. I've updated it since, but I, I can give you the, the updated one, which is entrepreneur, trainer, technologist, predicting the future by creating it, co-founder at Digital Skills Foundation, CEO and founder at ReferralWorks. And then I just have the Digital Skills Foundation uh, website. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, we will actually share your updated version just to be sure for everyone at some stage. Um, one thing I did want to point out is that Kieran actually has put in his, the website. So it's up to you what you decide you want to put on there. And, you know, it has different purposes. In his case, it makes sense because, you know, we're trying to get people to, we're using this for business purposes. So we want people to look at our website. But if you're doing it for work, I would suggest, you know, you can put your LinkedIn at the bottom of your Twitter. Okay. We've looked at that. I'll end it on this note. This is Facebook. Not really much to add here. Simply that Facebook, you can actually update your education and your work experience. Facebook, on the nice side of things, has allowed you to be able to enter uh, something about you, and there's no character limits. So on Facebook, you feel free to use as much space as you want. My suggestion, though, is because we know that short and sweet works best, and that's what gets read, feel free to copy and paste from your LinkedIn profile. In fact, that's what we do, and we give people access to our LinkedIn and to our Twitter uh, when we put our profiles up on Facebook. So that actually ends um, our first lesson, which is one hour and a half. We still have 10 minutes for questions, and we are going to get to that. I just want to end on one small note. This is food for thought as a recap for everything we've just discussed, which is remember that whether you realize it or not, you are always communicating something about yourself. And people will brand you if you don't brand yourself. So my biggest advice is please be the masters of your branding. Be sure that you know what you are communicating to others and be the person who decides what you want others to know about you. Okay, not to make that dramatic, but it was good for the Star Wars theme because it was just very appropriate to recent, uh, recent trends. So we're going to be taking questions. What I'll do is I'll be taking questions live. Uh, we only have 10 minutes, so we are going to be sure to end it in the next 10 minutes. If we don't get to you, I'll be sharing our details of how you can reach out to us. 
we will find ways. I will also be available after the class if anyone wants to speak to me. Um, we'll take some questions live, Kieran, I think, and we're going to alternate with people also on the webinar. So I'll try to take one from here and one from the webinar. How does that sound? Great. That sounds brilliant. Perfect. Okay, so we'll start maybe with live first. Yes, you had your hand up first. I saw you. Yeah, look, I re can even recommend professional people to take it, but I think the advice is simply there are personal digital cameras that can take excellent pictures. The idea is simply as long as the picture is good quality and it is on message as far as what it needs to deliver. I think that's the main compass that should guide everything. So I don't necessarily think you need to break. You what know, was the question? Uh, I'll repeat it in just a second. I'm just going to finish the, the train of thought. Just to answer the question is just that I think the idea is you don't need a professional picture. If you can, great. But the idea is just to make sure that the picture is good quality and it's going to it's going to work for what you're trying to do. Sorry, Kieran. The question was just simply if that we recommend it to use professional uh, photographer for the pictures. Okay. Yeah. No, that's always great. Um, I certainly know in in my university where I'm from. Uh, there's there are photographers around that actually do it for a fee. So for a small fee, um, I think I spent like 20 euros. I was able to get three or four really nice photos done, and they look really professional. In fact, I still use those photos today. So um, thoroughly recommend it. If you can get it done, do it. I think, as Kieran said, you know the good point is that professional pictures will last for a while. But it's something that you can reuse as you go along. Uh, maybe we'll take one from the webinar and then we'll come back. Yeah. Maybe, Kieran, you could read us one from the webinar and we'll try and respond here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let me see. Um, we have one from Chantal, I see. Um, Facebook is used by recruiters. How much can they really see if I keep my profile super private? Well, no, that's actually a very good question. And you know something? I didn't elaborate on that very much here because I know that Facebook is not our biggest priority, but um, having actually known people who used to work in Facebook's legal department, and I can tell you that Facebook takes privacy very, very seriously. Now, the one big argument that I love about people who talk about Facebook is I don't want people to see what I'm posting on Facebook. Well, yeah, well, I'm glad people are laughing. That's good. So I think you have an idea of where I'm trying to go with this. First of all, you are responsible for whatever you put on Facebook, I mean, you're in control of when you post that post button, right? Two is Facebook has a lot of restrictions and settings that you can use and you can customize. In fact, Facebook allows you to make sure that you can approve pictures before anybody can tag you. And if you really dislike a picture that someone is putting about you, you can actually report it to Facebook. And in fact, they take it very seriously and they will take it down, of course, if there's good reason for it. Now, my main thing with Facebook is it's up to you if you want to allow yourself to be seen or not. Um, as far as the job search, I don't see why it's necessary for someone to see you on Facebook. That's just my personal opinion. And all I know is I have mine on public because we need to use it for our business. So I'm just very careful about what I post on Facebook and I'm aware of what I put on there. But it's up to you, in fact, if you don't want people to see your Facebook. Um, personally, I don't think that it's a problem if you put yourself on private settings. And if a recruiter really wants to see your Facebook, that's another story. But, you know, I don't see why that should be a necessity. And that's my argument. Yes. Okay, sorry. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we are going to take a couple of questions here live. I think we have a lady here, and then I'll go back to the back as well. Take your question. Yes. Yeah, this is a discussion now on author's rights and copyrights. Um, it's slightly different to what we are normally talking about. Now, as far as I know, and I mean my own legal background is simply that, you know, you as the author and creator are the one who owns rights over those publications. So even if it is on LinkedIn, uh, somebody would still have to credit you for that, right? 
And especially if it's a document that has already been publicly acknowledged, i.e. if a you know, university has already recognized it, you know, that's something that somebody needs to quote you on. It's your right as an author. Now, if you should put it up there, I think it's relevant to what you might think is for your job. If you want somebody to read it, the entire thing, fine. If you want to maybe put the titles on it and say that you're happy to facilitate it for them, that's another one. I think that comes to your own personal judgment as to whether or not you want to put it on private, or sorry, on public or private mode. Um, the only thing I can say is that while it's technically in a court of law, and depends which court of law, right? And depends also where you protect your intellectual property because, you know, the EU has protection for 27 countries, Canada is separate, US is separate. Depending on where you put it, you know, it's still you who's responsible for actually pursuing somebody else that might be in violation of your copyrights. So, unless it's something super secret, um, I normally assume that it's something you want people to read and, you know, you're happy with them reading it. And I would assume that most of times anyways, it, it will be an opportunity for people to speak to you, you know, and for them to communicate. So, I tend to not be so scared about publishing things, but it's up to you. That's my response. Uh, I'll just go to the gentleman at the back because I know he had his hand and I'll come back to you. Oh, okay, well, we're good. Sorry, you had a question. Yes, and you know what, you need to see and to hear us. We're going to cover this a lot more in the coming up. And it's important for you to see Now, the main answer, and I can give you a quick sort of peek a peek of what's coming, is you don't always have to invent it. There's plenty of things that you can do to still seem active online without having to always publish. In fact, commenting on other people's content there's plenty of other people make you as valuable as one So that's a good um, introduction into what we're going to cover in some of the lessons. Yes? I didn't hear the second part of the question, but I'll respond to the first one and we can look at the second one. So, depends what you're doing. I mean, you have your own personal profile on Facebook, which is public or private as you decide. And you can create a business page or you can create an organization page or you can create all sorts of other separate pages. Now, each one of those is treated independently. It's up to you if you want to make them public or private. You know, normally we assume that a business page should be public because you want people to be able to see it. Now, it just really depends what you're trying to achieve with each one of them. You know, if you want one of them to be private and the other one to be public, that's up to you. And it really goes back once again to the goals. That's what we were talking about earlier. Um, I'm not really going to say much more on this because I don't have a lot of the context background, but you know, you can regulate for each one of your separate pages. It's a world onto its own. It's up to you whether you make it public or you make it private. Yes? The hook, yes, yes. Call to action, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, what is your goal? Let's start with that. What is your goal? Okay, well, what are you offering them as a service? You're helping them to... Okay, well, why not do, let's meet so I can, dis so I can help you to add value to your whatever it is. Yes, let's meet so I can add value to whatever it is. You're already selling yourself and you're asking them to meet with you. And then I would give your details as a matter of fact because you're going to go all the way through it. So follow through with all the steps. Tell them what you want them to do and give them all the tools to do it. Yeah. It's a bit the same. In fact, if you want, mine is very similar. You know, what I want is for people to connect with me. So that's what I say to them. Let's connect. And then I give them all my details. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, surprisingly, oh, sorry, Temi, you were going to say something. Uh, yes, in fact, I will restate the question, so I'll do my best on that. So the question that we're being asked, for all those of you who are joining on webinar, we're being asked from someone who has two job experiences, and they want to feature both job experiences, what's the best advice to do in that case? Or did I not get the question right? Two different careers. Okay. Okay. Sorry, do you have two different names in your LinkedIn? Okay. Let me see if I can answer this in a different way. Because one thing I can empathize is, I mean, I technically have two job descriptions as well. I do corporate coaching and I do also digital training, right? And they're two different things altogether. So the best advice I can give you is it always works with your ultimate goal, right? Are you trying to promote both or are you looking for one job? It depends on what you're trying to do. That's what should always be guiding your efforts. Now, if you have two and you want to promote two, the best thing I can say is that you should maybe find a way to include both. If you remember, and I don't know if we can go back here, What I did on my summary is I talk about the fact that I do two things. I mention it. In fact, I talk very specifically about what I do in each. And then in the bullet points, I've separated them. I talk about what I do in digital training, and then I talk about what I do in corporate coaching. So I try to very clearly explain to people what I do in each and to tell them that I do two things. There's not really much more that I could say on that because, you know, it's, it's, a, common, it's a common issue. In fact, a lot of people have varying experiences in multiple careers. As you well said, it's very pertinent to a lot of people. That's about as much as I can do. My own advice is maybe just to make sure that you are very clear about what you do in each and what you're looking for. Because it may be a little bit confusing and misguiding if you're just talking about your two experiences and then people are not really sure, so which one do you actually do? You'll need to explain somehow how they're both relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it answers the question. Yes. Well, it's a good thing that you asked the question about being vague. So I'm just going to try and repeat the question for everyone on webinar. Um, so the question was that, in fact, I'll rephrase it slightly, but it's basically how do you go about uh, conveying what it is that you do when your company doesn't want you to mention them specifically and, you know, for the name to be out there, right? Right, okay. Right, so the organization basically doesn't want you to talk about them too loudly and for you to be the person that's representing them, in other words. Okay, well, this is my answer to it, right, which is that your value and what you can offer is independent of the company itself, right? So if you think about it, the only part that I cannot really tell you anything is about being vague because I've seen it plenty of times where people will talk about the experience and what they've done without mentioning the company. They will just say, you know, one of the leaders in the financial institutions. And they'll just leave it at that. And that's perfectly fine and that's perfectly fair because you're not lying and you're just saying, you know, what is the truth and you're respecting the company's principles at the same time. So that's perfectly fine. I would just try and use the industry because ultimately what you're trying to say is that you have experience in the industry. And the fact that you're publishing, as long as it's something that's important to you and doesn't necessarily mention the company, it's perfectly fine and fair game as well. If, for example, you're to write something that advances the cause of financial industry or financial services, you're not necessarily doing it to talk about RBC. You're doing it for yourself and as an industry expert, and that is perfectly fine as well. So that's my advice, is just simply to try and use... You can be vague at least about the industry and the name without having to point them out. You can do that. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. I 
Well, I'm glad you brought it up because I know it's a, it's a common issue that a lot of students face. So I'm just going to repeat it for people who are joining us on the, on the webinar. So for people who have uh, student experience, may not have you know, the official job experience, how do they go about uh, branding themselves? Well, my answer to you is simple. Is In fact, it's something that pretty much anyone who ever was a student had to do at some stage, which is even though you are a student, you still have experience of some sort. It's perfectly fine, for example, in your tagline to write, I'm a student in marketing or a student with experience in marketing. You know, that is fair. You've probably worked on projects that can prove that you have this experience, which I would mention. You probably have publications that can talk about this experience that you can use. You can also be part of many different organizations, which is fair for you to put that as far as your experience. You know, for example, I did plenty of volunteering before I got any of my jobs. I used to volunteer for CETA before I ended up working for Foreign Affairs. And you know, it's volunteer work, but it still counts as far as experience. You can show that you're someone who has had leadership experience. You can talk about real communication situations, dealing with people, all the things that you're going to be asked in an interview. Now, because you're a student and it's your first time job, you're not going to be put down for that. It's still about how well you sell yourself and how well you sell the experience that you have. So that's my response. Yeah. Yes, you have a question. Um, I'm not really sure I understand the question exactly. Yeah, you know, it's, it's absolutely fair experience. You know, just because it's not paid experience doesn't mean it's not experience. And in fact, you know, it's, it's, it's not a question of a salary. You know, it's a question of what can you bring to the table that is valuable and you know that will transfer onto the new company. It's always what you need to find the way to explain. So yes you can bring that experience and remember that LinkedIn is not just about finding jobs it's also about networking and branding yourself. So you know you can publish, you know you can put together things that will show and convey your experience on LinkedIn. It's a perfect platform if you will to actually showcase what you've done. And I would talk about these experiences because you know there's a good chance in networking situations um, people in companies volunteer. People in companies are part of organizations. You know, or they donate to organizations. So any of those connections that you can make is perfectly fine and it's valuable. Remember that the opportunity for human con connections uh, in through volunteer organizations is probably one of the largest. And I can tell you there's a lot of sympathy and a lot of appreciation for people who do volunteer work. So yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I don't think there's anything inappropriate about putting your phone number. Maybe I'll just repeat the question, I guess. I don't need to do that also. So the question was, um, at the end of your LinkedIn summary, would you add your phone number and would you add your email, uh, especially in a job search scenario? So, yes, I would do it because personally what I want is for people to reach me and I want for them to be able to reach me. Now, I don't think it's a problem if you just put your email and you prefer to have written correspondence. Um, it really depends on the recruiter if they prefer phone, but personally, I always like the idea of being reachable. That's my number one goal as a person. Um, this is your choice. If you prefer to screen them through email, then just put your email. But there's no either wrong or right answer in this one. You know, I know that I like the phone because if somebody wants to reach me over phone, it's quick, it's effective, and I know that the opportunity for me to speak to someone is actually going a lot further than somebody who's communicated to me via email. There's a lot more personality that comes across over phone. And in fact, I really like to be able to speak to someone because all of a sudden they will know things about me on the fly that they would never have been able to discover on a CV. But this is just me and I'm not trying to, to taint your, your response on this one. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead.
Oh, okay, sorry. I'll just repeat the question and then see if this is correct. So you don't have a LinkedIn profile picture? Okay, and you're trying to find out if it's devaluing your profile. Okay, um, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> That's the way I like to put it. So the good news is you're not going to be devalued because LinkedIn doesn't work that way necessarily. So you're not losing points. What might happen though is that you're not going to be as high in the ranking score because LinkedIn wants a picture. And the reason it wants a picture is, you know, for the same reason that any recruiter would want a picture. They want to know who you are and, you know, if it comes to the point where they think you're a great candidate, they want to be able to see you and recognize you when it comes to that. So I'm not going to ask why you don't have it. I just think that it is advantageous to have a picture there. Yeah. Hmm. I understand. Believe me, I'm very empathetic. I, I do understand that. Now, of course, in the sense of fairness, you know, we should not have pictures and, you know, that should be not allowed. This is the world of social media. I don't make the rules. And all I can tell you is people like pictures. And that's unfortunate but true. And that's the world we live in and the one we have to work with. So I'm with you 100%, but I think if you want to be on the successful side, you might have to have a picture. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, the slides and the recording will be facilitated for everyone. You'll be having a chance to do this. Uh, in fact, we are going to even tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about next time. So I'll be talking about, uh, in fact, I'll be previewing. Let me just get that. To try and entice you all to join us for the next session, which is going to be here on the 18th, which is next week, Thursday, uh, between 12 and 1.30. And what we're going to be looking at is part two of your online branding, which we're going to focus a lot more on the technology side of things. In fact, the, the score your SSI is going to be the big subject of this one. So we're going to be looking at ranking, keywords, how to basically make your profile a lot more viewable for the computer as well. Make sure that you rank highly. Okay. So, yes, we have one more question. I believe it is, and I might let her conclude. Yes. So the question is, can we alternate between doing webinar and doing live? So. Yeah, I suppose we could uh, could alternate because some of the questions actually that came in in the webinar are pretty good. <laughs> okay. Well, I did really appreciate this. I suppose we're going to close on this note, but just thank you to all for joining, and we hope it was useful. I will still be around for anyone who wants to ask any questions. Um, we also have our details, so they're all available here. You can communicate to myself, you can communicate to Kieran, feel free to reach us both. We're happy to have your questions, and you know what, this was a real pleasure, and I want to say thanks again to Concordia for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for everything this evening. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Kieran, for being online, and for all of you for attending, and those of you on the webinar as well. This was a great first session. We're very happy uh, with the turnout and with the content. It was great. Um, I just want to remind you that we're going to be sending out a survey post-event, and we would really appreciate you uh, filling it out and, and um, returning it to us uh, as quickly as possible. It's going to be online, so following uh, maybe a few days, you're going to get it uh, by email. And uh, I think we're just going to proceed to the uh, draw for the business cards. Uh, did anybody? Not give it to me. Okay, so Donna, I'm just going to get the last card. I can see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give Julian the honor of, uh, of choosing, so there's no... <laughs> okay, so 
That's good. Okay. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you for participating. And uh, thank you all. So feel free to network a little bit if you uh, if you can stay a little bit or ask your question to Jillian. Thank you. Have a good evening. Hey guys, one last thing. If you can just let your uh, name tags at the door, there's a basket. If you can just put them in, we'd like to recycle them. Thank you.